FM4 Reality Check Special with TC Boyle in conversation with Chris Cummins. Yes, what an honor for us at FM4. TC Boyle, you've returned to see us in the FM4 studios again. It's great to see you. Thanks Chris. I'm happy to have returned to Vienna. Tomorrow at this time, if all goes well in the world, I will be on the airplane back to California. But you've come here today armed, if I can put it that way, with a new book, The Harder They Come. Um, I believe it's a title you took from a Jimmy Cliff song. The harder they come, the harder they fall, one and all. So, yes, indeed. And it has, its phrase in English continues, the harder they come, the harder they fall. So it's an idea of... Um, This, it's a book about American gun violence. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll talk about what the book's about. Um, first of all, we'll play the song, oh, ha The Harder They Come, right. and then we'll talk about the book, The Harder They Come. T.C. Boyle in the studio for a full hour with FM Fear Reality Check. The Harder They Come from Jimmy Cliff. T.C. Boyle, he's here in the studio with us for one full hour. T.C., I was going to say that song's particularly for you, but I think it's for all of us. What, what a fantastic song. Harder They Come, the name of your new book. Uh, I don't want to give anything away. I'm always terrified of spoilers. So why don't you tell us what The Harder They Come is all about? Okay, Chris, we'll make it easy on everybody. They all die in the end. Okay. That's the story. It's a violent book. I mean, it's a high-octane <laughs> book. Your last book, San Miguel, was atmospherically claustrophobic, intense, a bit of a slow burner. The inner lives of three women. Maybe Nicole Kidman could have played the film role. She This could have played one, all three. Yeah. This one, The Harder They Come, I can see Clint Eastwood in there. It's a, a violent uh, book. It's about violence. Yes, this is a, a shift in pace for me from, as you say, the quiet, hermetic atmosphere of... San Miguel into a book about American gun violence. And you mentioned Clint Eastwood. He is of the age. Actually, he's a little bit too old. The uh, father of the gunman in this story is 70. And he's a hero because he uses what I would call proactive self-defense, whereas there's other sorts of violence that in the USA uh, um, are not welcomed. Some forms of violence are sort of your hero worship for being a violent man. All of this, by the way, Chris, comes from the press. I had read a story about an old man on a uh, cruise. In, uh, it was in Mexico. In my telling, it's in Costa Rica because I know that country very well. Um, he's confronted by a gunman, and he reacts instinctively and kills the gunman with his bare hands, for which he is celebrated as a hero in America. And then the, the son of this man who is celebrated as a hero becomes an anti-hero, although he's also a violent man. Yes. Uh, while this is happening, a few weeks later, back in California, northern California, his son Adam, who is developing uh, a form of schizophrenia, uh, in his delusion, shoots two people with his assault rifle and then disappears into the forests of northern California where he is able to evade the police with all of their police dogs and their helicopters for five weeks. Well, I'll tell you what, Reality Check is a current affairs show, and this book throws up all sorts of issues I'd like to talk about with you. And also, our listeners have been uh, collecting uh, questions for me to ask to you, and it's an ongoing process. So we'll listen to some more music, and then we'll fire some of those questions at you. Do you like Alt-J? Yes, very much so. Good. tra la la tra la tra la Alt J on this reality check special of TC Boyle. TC, you like that song a lot, huh? Yeah, I love the changes in it. And when I, I first heard it, I was completely blown away because I had no idea where this is coming from. I didn't even know what language they're talking in. It didn't matter. I was just completely swept away by the changes of the song. It's, it's brilliant. You famously always listen to music whilst writing. Could you write alongside Alt J? Absolutely not. No way. Far too distracting. Uh, I'm basically listening to nonverbal music when I'm writing because I don't want to be drawn out of the, the dream of writing. And we're uh, talking about your writing today, and we've been collecting questions from the cloud intelligence. Our FM Fear listeners have been pitching some questions, and we have very intelligent uh, listeners. I've got Afa here, who has a question about the very beginning of your book. In your new novel, you have a quote of D.H. Lawrence in the beginning, which says, 
The essential American soul is hard, isolated, stoic, and a killer. It has not melted yet. And I would like to ask you, how could this heart be melted? Okay, how can the heart be melted of America? Oh, shucks. I mean, just give us a couple of puppies and we'll all just fall over and give love to the world. But I love that you are picking out this epigraph for the book. This is a sort of proposition that I found. Don't forget, this is written by D.H. Lawrence, an Englishman in the 1920s, about the American soul and its propensity towards violence. It it operates as a proposition in the book so that the whole book can evolve, in my point of view, to say, is it true or is it not? Um, to answer your question seriously, uh, I don't know. I have no idea how to melt this hard violent American soul. Is America more violent than other places? And is violence and extremism as extremism in this book? Is it any different than violence and extremism, say, in Europe? I don't think so. I think, uh, you know, what we see recently in the uh, uh, attacks by Islamic fundamentalists uh, in Copenhagen and in Paris, uh, it's, it's a strike at a democratic society. Uh, what I'm writing about are individual shooters in America who are disaffected from society. But essentially, they're doing the same thing. They're trying to punish us for being who we are. But there are angry, disturbed people everywhere in the world. I'm you, one of them, Chris. <laughs> it seems to me that in the United States, it's perhaps easier for these disturbed, angry people to get their hands on automatic weapons. Absolutely. And again, uh, I delivered this book in the fall of 2013, in the interval, last spring, there was a very similar, eerily similar attack in Santa Barbara, where I live, in which a lone young white gunman, mentally disturbed, uh, opened fire on people at random. And the father of one of the victims said, I blame this on the NRA, the National Rifle Association, the gun lobby in America, which controls both houses of Congress because of the money that they contribute to political funds. Well, in that, in that question, I've actually got something I have to add here, because we have another listener who wants to ask something on, on that topic. How can we make gun manufacturers like Austria's Glock accountable for crimes against humanity? Yeah, that's Nikolai. Um, even as far away as the United States. Nikolai has this question. Can you hold these manufacturers, the big business behind gun violence, if you like, um, to, to account? We can legislate anything we want if we are truly a democracy. But what has happened in America is the corporatization of politics so that the money given by the gun lobby prevents anybody from opposing them. What I would do is rewrite the laws so that uh, politicians are not allowed to use any private money to fund their campaign, and all lobbyists should be banned. That would be a good start right there. T.C. Boyle talking about the origins of violence in America. There are other aspects of particular American violence we can talk about, but let's listen to some more music, this time from an American band. This is The Strokes. FM4. Reality Check Special. Chris Cummins speaks to T.C. Boyle live. Yeah, Hurt in the Johnny Cash version. How about that? Great song. Yeah, I love it uh, even better than the Nine Inch Bale, uh, Nails version because he really gets at the emotion and he slows the song down and you get those brilliant lyrics that just tears your heart out. I've got some questions for you about your work now, your work that tears my heart out sometimes when I'm reading it. This is a, um, a question from Kati in Graz, and she's interested in the mythology of the United States, in the mythology of this pioneer era in the United States. It plays a big role in your book. One of the main characters is obsessed with this era. Um, this nostalgia for a time when in the USA the government didn't have a big power over individual lives. How strong a role does the, 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 the kind of rose-tinted nostalgia about that time play in American life? I can't speak to the rest of the Americans or the rest of my countrymen, but for me it's huge. Uh, I think many of my books have a yearning to go back to a simpler past. The Drop City, for instance, set in 1969, in which the uh, Back to the Earth movement, the hippies, uh, try to withdraw from this crazy consumer society. But of course, we can't go back to the Earth. There's nothing left. We've extinguished pretty much everything. We've got global warming. There are 7 billion of us. But of course, we want to go back to a simpler time. I have another question. Someone waiting on the line, Ulrika. Uh, 
Ulrika, what's your question for TC Boyle? Uh, can you just ask your question? Hello, TC. My question Hi, to you Ulrika. is, um, do you have any favorite word? My favorite word of today is going to be calipigian, which means having beautiful buttocks. And it's very important to me since I was born without buttocks. But my favorite word every day, all day, yes. is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Good to share. And um, Zita, you had a question. The uh, Zita Baroita, the head of literature at FM Fear, by the way. Hello, Zita. Hello. <laughs> it's not my question, but uh, a listener sent us a question. He emailed us, and that's just goes just into the other uh, direction. Which word do you hate? Johannes Light. No wants to know that. Hmm. I hate no. Okay. This is the word that I most hate. Is there any word that you think sounds ugly? Hate word that sounds ugly? Any word that sounds ugly. No, no. No, no. Okay. <laughs> well, let's play some more music. Another artist that I know you admire, and I'm so glad you chose this because I have a, a huge crush on Nina Simone. I think she's absolutely oh, a wonderful yeah. artist. Ooh. So please don't let me be. Nina Simone on FM Fear, the playlist today chosen by my guest T.C. Boyle, who's honoured us with his uh, presence here in the FM Fear studios. Thanks, Chris. There's a, a clip of Nina Simone you can find on YouTube, her live in Paris performance of 63 or something. Yeah, wonderful. She is out. She goes right out of her body. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's astonishing. Well, you talk about 1963. I want to go around uh, back to around that era. It's uh, 50 years this year since the first U.S. troops arrived in Vietnam. One of the characters in your new book, The Harder They Come, is a, a Vietnam veteran, and he seems very haunted by that experience. Now, interestingly, you dodged the draft, if I can put it that way. You didn't go there. How did you get out of it. I disagreed politely in a democracy, which is my right, with the government. I felt that we were interfering illegally in a civil war and it was none of our business. But of course, they didn't ask me. They simply measured me and prepared me to be one more body filling in a mud hole. Uh, in that day, I was 21 years old. It was considered vital to the national security if you worked as a teacher in a underprivileged school. And in the community where I grew up, this was exactly the situation. I had never seen a child before. I had no vocation for teaching. I didn't know anything about it, but I did it. Um, and it was great because it's given me a lifelong love of teaching. I continue to teach now in the university. Um, listeners who are interested can look at my rare, or I rarely write autobiographical stories, but there's one called Up Against the Wall, which will give you a very good idea of how I felt in that day. In the area of Vietnam, you were an activist. You were an anti-war activist. Do you consider yourself an activist on any subject nowadays? Only through my novels. You know, again, I'm often called a green writer or an environmentalist. And yes, I consider myself an environmentalist, not because I'm marching on the street or waving banners or writing to politicians, it's because I like to go out in the woods by myself alone. And so if I'm an activist, it's only through my art. So that we're talking about gun violence in the U.S., I'm as mystified by it as anyone else. And so I've written a book to try to determine where it might be coming from and what it might mean. Do you think if we really thought about issues, and rather than having some slogans and a Twitter campaign or whatever, but really sat down and thought about what issues meant, that might be a better answer than a, a big banner at a protest? Of course, this is self-serving to give this answer, but I think um, a novel is a unique way of getting into the mind of someone different from yourself, so that the three characters in this book, all of whom are anti-authoritarian, two of whom are extremely violent, nonetheless, I mean, we can't agree with what they do or even how they think, but nonetheless, if you get inside of someone's mind, you can understand and sympathize with them. And I hope, if I've done my job, that this is what happens in this book. Well, I'll tell you what, I've been a bit self-indulgent. I wanted to ask that question because I'm on my way to Vietnam next week. I'm going to look at some of these old scenes of that war that changed U.S. history, modern U.S. history. Are you going for yep, pleasure? I'm going or for is... pleasure. But to get us in the mood, let's play some music from that era. This is Along the Watchtower, but it's in the Eddie Vedder, Eddie Vedder Ooh, version. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. What a track. Eddie Vedder, all along the Watchtower.
This is a special FM Thea reality check show with me, Chris Cummings, but more importantly with T.C. Boyle. He's chosen some music. I chose that song for you, T.C. That's my gift to you. Did you like it? Thanks, Chris. Yes, I love the song. Um, I saw Eddie Vedder live cover my favorite Dylan song of all, Masters of War. He's a brilliant singer. Of course, the original Dylan Masters of War, I don't think anybody could ever top that. As for the song you just played, All Along the Watchtower, in my earliest incarnation as a singer in a band, uh, I did a shrieking sort of Hendrix version of that one. It's a good one. Okay. No longer. They caught me out there, TC Boy. I thought they'd finished. They yeah, haven't had yeah. that. You have yeah, to yeah. know the song, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> and you... he's a good, I mean, I defy anyone to hear the end of that song without singing along. It's just beautiful. It's the song that makes me think of uh, life in a, a log cabin in the middle of the woods. I know you do a lot of your writing in such a, an environment. It's also um, part of the atmosphere of your new book, The Harder They Come. There's a special sort of magic of, of forests, isn't there? Yes, of course. But normally when I'm sitting in that forest writing my book, looking out the window of the cabin, and then I go into the woods. I'm listening to Mozart's Requiem over and over. <laughs> if you've just tuned in, you're listening to the voice of T.C. Boyle, the great American writer. He's here to answer some of my questions and some of your questions. For example, Andy from Altenmarkt, he's written in, that's in this Salzburg, by the way, it's beautiful. He's written in with a, a question I find very interesting. He says, uh, the main character in your book suffers from some sort of uh, schizophrenia, it seems. It's notoriously hard, of course, to get into the mind of someone suffering from mental illness. Um, I, and there's a friend of yours from college, I think, who suffered from schizophrenia. Did that help you um, when writing this book, your experience with this close friend? Two of my closest friends, one growing up whom I'd known since birth, I suppose, um, parted ways with me when he was 19 or 20. He was gone, absolutely gone into schizophrenia. And later, uh, at the Iowa Writers Workshop, I had a friend who uh, I loved, but... Uh, got lost, totally lost in, in his mental problems. And so this is uh, uh, something that means a great deal to me to try to inhabit a schizophrenic character. One way, of course, to um, stop tragedies involving mentally disturbed people is stopping their access to guns. But do you think there's any way we can reach out to troubled minds in, in a more proactive way so it, it doesn't yeah. come to the tragic situations that we often see? We have privacy laws, of course, and so in the case of the true case that I'm writing about, uh, of course I'm fictionalizing it, and in the case of this shooter in Santa Barbara last spring, both these young men were mentally disturbed and their parents tried to intervene. Now they had uh, sent them to the psychiatrist and give them psychotropic drugs and so on, but once you become 18, you can do anything you want, and privacy laws prevent your parents, the police, anybody else from looking at your mental record. It's tricky, isn't it? That balance between our right to privacy and the need to protect loved ones and protect society as a whole. You know, here in Wien, we're kind of close to the former Soviet Union, and they used to have a guy there, you probably never heard of him, called Joe Stalin. And he liked to accuse anyone who opposed him of being insane and then lock them up. So in our democracies, we have to be very careful about the fine line between uh, determining who might be potentially dangerous and who is just uh, a free spirit. You know, we've um, got many ways to contact FM Fear, including via our own Facebook page. Um, someone has left not so much as a question as a comment, right, Sita? Yeah, and zwar jemand mit dem schönen Nickname We deeply apologize for all the rubbish and overpriced art. Und der oder sie hat geschrieben, er ist einfach so ein cooler Hund. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're a cool dog. <laughs> I also own a cool dog, a Hungarian pulley with dreadlocks. Ah, uh, beautiful. And I think it even appears in the new book, The Harder They Come, there's a, a, what's called a ragga dog there, a dog with dreadlocks. Yes, the reggae dog. This is the first dog, now expired, unfortunately, but reincarnated in this book, Kucha. Hang on, you put your own dog into I a novel. Indeed. How much of your own family, your own uh, environment, of your own personality do you put into these books? Of course, Chris, it all depends on the book or the short story that I'm writing. In short, 
very, very little. But it is fun to reincarnate your poor dead dog and put and his personality comes through in this in this book. He's one of the real stars. I recommend you read this book, Harder They Come, and then read the uh, yeah, book. Hi, Sita. I just wanted to ask another question that Nikolai asked. Are you a cat person or a dog person? I think this is a discussion point that came up previously before we went on the air. And my um, answer is, in short, I was exclusively a dog person, but then a woman came into my life and she brought a cat with her. And how could you, you know, how could you not give full love to all the creatures of the earth? Reality Check Special with T.C. Boyle in conversation with Chris Cummins. Yeah, and in not in conversation for very long. It's very sad for me, but we're coming to the end of our time together. We have time, T.C., for another live question from one of our FM Fear listeners. Her name's Diana. Diana, pose your question. Hello? Hello. Hello, T.C. Hi, okay. Diana. Okay. Um, every book starts very peacefully. In the beginning, everything seems to be fine and harmonic, but it always ends in tragedy and chaos, etc. So um, my question is, will you ever write a book with a happy ending? Well, Diana, it sounds just like the story of everybody's life, beginning in peace and tranquility and ending in chaos. Will I write a happy ending? Well, uh, I hope so. I hope to have better news. If you look carefully at America, the tortilla curtain, the final gesture, I think, could be considered happy. Do you always take your books to the, the natural conclusion you think that it has to have? Or do you sometimes think, oh, come on, let's just give this guy a break? Never. No, no. It, it finds itself. And I have to be true to the story. And I'm sorry if I have bad news for the world. I'm a depressed guy. But... Maybe there'll be good news. Maybe I will take it as a challenge, Diana, to write one with a delightful, happy, singing, bird singing kind of ending. It's coming. Just wait. I, be- uh, I believe sometimes you don't know the end of your novel, particularly when you know. begin it. Okay. No, I never know the end of a short story or the novel. Uh, uh, what would be the point of writing it if I knew? It all happens in the dream each day as it progresses. Diana, thank you so much for your question. T.C. Ball, thank you thank so you. much. For okay. coming in. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Cheers. But- and thank you so much for coming in today. Uh, you'll be in the Garten Balkino in Vienna later giving a talk too. I want to give you a.